on Friday, February the 24th, 1989, at the world-famous Melbourne Cricket Ground, over 350 people attended a formal dinner to celebrate the launch of a new book, Tigerland, and to honour a football legend, Jack Captain Blood Dyer. one of the great traditional clubs. Famous for the Eat them Alive cry and I suppose we can be proud that we can boast that we've had the who's who of football both in players and administrators and of course colourful personalities. We've had some colourful nicknames over the years. We've had a Captain Blood We've had a dirty Dick Harris. We've had a Mopsy Fraser. A skinny Titus. We've had a Bugsy Barrett. We've had a Roger the Dodger Dean. And I dare say some characters that would have made Walt Disney proud. The Swamp Fox, The Whale, Carrot Top, Swooper, Big Gun, Bones, Disco, Flea, The General, A Ghost, A Moose, A Fang. We've had a Nifty. And we have had a Hungry. I know how all the others got their nicknames, but I'm not quite certain how I got mine. <laughs> sure, I may have been asked that if I was 75 metres out in the grand final and Rochi was by himself, would I kick the ball to him? It is a silly question. <laughs> if you're that close, you'd always have a shot, wouldn't you, really? <laughs> I mentioned the whale before, and he's sitting down there, and I'm glad that uh, it's 1989, because we'd have to change the rules if he was playing with us today. We'd only be able to have two men in the centre square. <laughs> Still looks to be at his playing weight to me anyway. <laughs> Certainly tonight, we can relive the, the full spectrum of the club, meet the people who have made it so successful, and of course relive some of the, the memorable moments. From 1885 to 1989, 105 year history. And of course it does encompass all of those great years when the club was very, very successful. The 1920s when names such as Minogue and Herbert and James came to the fore. In the 30s, the Dyers, the Strangs, the Sheens, the Tituses and the Bentleys all made themselves household names. In the 40s, the Broadstocks, the Offies, and the Dickie Harrises. Of course, the 50s were battling years, years where the club had to really dig in to try and survive, and of course, build the foundation for the years ahead. The successful 60s, the Deans, the Pattersons, Ganains, all from that era. From the unsuccessful era to be there when the club was very successful. 
of course, in the 70s, when we had the, the greats of Greens and the Burks and the Sheedies and the Richardsons and the Sprouls, right through to the 80s, where the Lees and the Waitmans and the Roaches and the Jess and the Rollings all made it happen for the Richmond Football Club. In fact, there has been 912 players play for the Richmond Football Club in its history. And that's a figure that's been compiled by Billy Meeklin, the club historian. I must say that I consider myself very, very lucky that my surname begins with the letter B because the Bs have it at Richmond. They have the most number of players, 101 Bs have played for Richmond. There's been 90 S's play for Richmond. But any player whose surname starts with the letter Z, only one has ever played. And that was Eric Zeck in 1935. If your name started with a Y, you also were in a lot of trouble. Selection committee didn't like you, only one has ever played for Richmond. Stan Yates in 1925. Letter U, two have played, but they had to be brothers. F and J Unwin in 1937. Qs, we've had two. They had to be brothers though. Jack and Roy Quinn, 41 and 44. We've had four eyes though, last being Ron Irvine in 1951. We've had three Vs, one's here tonight, Vernon, Valentine and Vandersloos. And lucky for Jack, he wasn't playing when Jack was broadcasting. <laughs> Probably would have called him Vanderhaar. <laughs> and our history book shows that in fact, one player, W. James, only played one game for the Richmond Football Club. That was in 1920, and it just happened to be the 1920 Premiership side. <laughs> Obviously, he felt it was pretty easy after that. <laughs> Probably went off to the Boer War or something like that, I'd imagine. But one game and one Premiership. And it's amazing the people you meet when you travel around the countryside who have been associated with the Richmond Football Club. I was in Adelaide during 1988, and I was standing watching a game, Glenelg play against Sturt, and this elderly gentleman came up to me, uh, tapped me on the shoulder, introduced himself. He said he was in Melbourne during the war, played five games with Richmond, including the 1943 Grand Final. His name was Stan Hunt, and he had great memories of the club. So, undoubtedly, there are people all around Australia who have had some something to do with the, the great Richmond Football Club. I suppose with uh, the opportunity of having every player listed in the book tonight, that gives you the opportunity, same as it has given me, to pick my best ever side of the Richmond Football Club. Now, of course, if you don't know all the names that play for the football club, you can leave people out. But of course, you can't now. And I've picked my best ever side. It may be something like yours. Maybe we can look afterwards and uh, exchange notes. But my best ever Richmond side from the book, from the back line, would be green, brown and white. <laughs> My half back line would be wood, steel and clay. <laughs> My centre line would be Ford, Morris and Bentley. <laughs> My half forward line, Waterhouse, Stonehouse and Malthouse. <laughs> we did have one other house playing for us, but <laughs> he didn't make my team. Full forward line, very strong, Valentine Loveheart. <laughs> Rux, one of the best ever to represent the club, Cook Sarah Lee. <laughs> Interchange would be Fox and Crow. <laughs> and emergencies, Shepherd and Lamb. <laughs> it's all there in the history book. And uh, right throughout the night, 
we hope to present to you a number of people who will entertain you and certainly uh, reminisce and give you some insight and some thoughts into their memories of the Richmond Football Club. But it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the man whose committee made it all ha happen, the president of the former Players Association, Mr Tom Allen. The reason we're here tonight really is to celebrate the, um, the launching of, of Tigerland. I'd like to thank, first of all, the Richmond Football Club because, as I said, we're only an ancillary group, but they gave us the full support of their office staff and, and, and any other thing that, that could be done. They support us in every way. And without that support, we would have been shot. There were, there were, um, Joy Irwin was done a power of work. She'd worked tirelessly for this. Without her, without her uh, total support, we, we were in shot. Pauline Satchel, as you know, enormous in her organisation and help. <laughs> At this point of time, I would like to officially launch the, the Tigerland, the history of Richmond. I also, it's before I leave, I have a, a, uh, another duty. I would like Neville Crow, the president of the Richmond Football Club, to come up here, please. Yes. <laughs> on behalf of, the, on behalf of the, the, the publishers, the Richmond Former Players Association, we had 10 leather-bound, only 10 leather-bound copies with gold embossing uh, printed with, with the special editions tonight, plus the other books. There are only 10 of these printed. And one of the, one of the uh, criteria we put down to the, uh, we said to the club, these are never to be sold. The club can do what they like with them, but they are never to be sold. They can be auctioned or given Except to... 10 bucks. <laughs> 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 they can begin with, like, we won't, we will not, they're not up for sale. And this book is one of the first two printed, and we'll, I'd like to uh, um, present this to Neville as president of the, of, the, of the Richmond Football Club to do or keep in safekeeping anywhere he'd like in the Richmond Football Club. And Neville, I have great pleasure in presenting you this letter. Thank you. Tom, thank you for that. The first thing I want to say very, very sincerely to you and all the people that have put this book together, to Ronnie and of course to, uh, to Brian, Brian Hanson, who's put this uh, book together, that I feel on behalf of the Richmond Football Club, the board of directors, everyone connected with the club, the staff, the players and everybody, that. I feel exceptionally proud to be the lucky man in 105 years to hold this thing up in front of you people and say this is the history of the Richmond Football Club so far. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's involved with the production of this magnificent piece of equipment. Everyone here has got one tonight and there will be many, many thousands of these books sold. They're a perfect coffee table thing, they're a wonderful Christmas present, they're a birthday present, they're anything you like. But this leather bound volume, Tom, will certainly go in pride of place in our memento cabinet along with silver cups and all the other things that you know well and many of you other people in this room know well that are down at the Richmond Football Club. We will treasure this my friend and it's great that you people have put this together and I also acknowledge the fact that you've trusted the current administration and players and coaching panel to put it together at this time because there's been a question mark for a couple of years as to uh, what was going to happen and we take it as a mark of respect and trust that you reckon we're going to do the job for you and everyone else out there. So thank you Tom. Thank you. So I said at the official press launch down there on the day, the 20th of February, 105 years from the day that the Richmond Football Club was born, that history is about people and it is about events. And we've certainly got some history and events at the Richmond Football Club. KB certainly mentioned some of them. But we have had the players. We have had the officials, the administrators, the staff, the supporters down through the decades who've made this club one of the most famous Australian football clubs internationally. You can go to New York and people know something about the Richmond Football Club. But this is a, an incredible thrill. You know, I, I know sitting at our table, we look around and can glance just to our left and see Jack Dyer sitting there. We can glance around and see the, the Des Rose and the Max Oppies and the people that made this club famous over a period of time. This is an enormous thrill. This will go down in history. All of you people here will go down in history tonight because this is one very, very, very special night. 
Unless you're here 105 years from today, it's real special. <laughs> and if you want to book your tickets, we'll take it, but the inflation being what it is, you'll probably have to pay about five grand or something. The Richmond Football Club is in extremely good hands in every division of the organisation, and we can promise everyone that supports us that this year you're going to see a, a very, very mean fighting machine out there. And we intend, like the other 13 clubs, to have a very strong aim at hitting that final five. And if we get there, look out. But I hope you have an excellent evening, folks, and uh, enjoy yourself. It's a marvellous hist historical evening, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much indeed. Very much and away they go and oh and down they go and up they come again the ball comes down the open he says get out of my way son this is a man's game crash bang down they go the ball spills out it's a long torpedo punch kicking and the teeth goal scores a little one point the difference right into the teeth goal and oh if you don't mind Certainly uh, a wonderful character, a wonderful person. I know that in the, the days when the club was down and needed to get players that Graham Richmond and Jack Dyer went around all of Australia trying to sign players and bring players to the Richmond Football Club. And Jack obviously had a tremendous impact on helping Graham to get players signatures to come down and play for Richmond who at that particular time were on the bottom of the ladder. So Jack, we owe you a great debt and we do have a presentation to make to you tonight. So Jack, could you please give us the honour of coming to the lectern? Maybe just a couple of words tonight, I know that everyone would appreciate it. Jack Dyer. I'll teach him to speak again that time. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do when I go. <laughs> I got he's just a mileage out of me. <laughs> 19 years of playing and also following which when it seems such a crowd here as I've seen tonight. Not only that, but there's a wealth of players that are I had the pleasure of coaching here tonight, some that I haven't seen for years. They bobbed up tonight and they were the first to come and say hello. It's lovely, the most loveliest thing in the world to have those players to come up and say hello again. Because when you're captain and coach, it is a different thing to being coach, just a plain ordinary coach. Because you get to love the players you're playing with and you're the father of confessor to them. You get all their bloody troubles. <laughs> If their wife can't cook, you've got to go up and do a cut in the belt. As George Sweeten, poor George, he had twice for a week and never told me. <laughs> Talk about memories, I'd love to go through them. You were talking about Ray Dunn tonight. Well, I suppose he could fix anything too when you said something like that. Uh, I must tell the story. I don't like telling these stories, but because um, I was a very fair footballer, I must say that. <laughs> They wrote a book that Collingwood killed for Collingwood. Well, I killed for Richmond. <laughs> and uh, I was playing that day when Wilson uh, got knocked onto the fence at Melbourne. And I didn't like Melbourne much. <laughs> and uh, this, this Dean's a back pocket player. That's right, kill the bludgers, he said, you know, and I heard him. I said, I'll give you a kill. I rushed up the field, you know, right down the centre. And who was coming but Hannah, about six foot three, top pace he was, and didn't see me. <gasps> It was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, he went up in the air, bounced three times when he came down. <laughs> Never moved. And I looked around. I generally ran on, but I looked at him because I was a bit worried. So, because Doc Corden had come along and said, you better put the blanket over him. <laughs> I said to Doc, as he did, he said, he looks like it. <laughs> So they took him off the ground and I was very worried at half time and I said to Ray Dunn, I said, I think I've killed him. He said, don't worry, it's only manslaughter. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I can get you out of that. That's a good thing. So, uh, 
That was a, not, not the end of the story. Uh, when I come out, I was, I was looking for Deans because he abused me all the way across the ground coming off. So I said to Deans, you just bobbed your red up once, I'm going to put you right over the grandstand. <laughs> so we went and hid in the back pocket. <laughs> but I was on a fellow in ammo. He was a real amateur. I'll never forget him. He spoke beautifully. And I said to him, how is Hannah? He said, Jack, he's all right. Not much wrong with him. He's only got a broken collarbone, three busted ribs, that's all. He looks like he's going to be all right. I said, good God. I said, you're next, you know. He said, oh, not me, not me. I'm not gonna... But I think I was a bit mad. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I didn't like them doing any to our players. Another one there, Oppie. Loved him. Uh, he was another one that didn't feel pain. That's what I liked about him. <laughs> you could hit him with everything, but he didn't feel it. <laughs> but we were sitting down in the dressing room. We were playing in the grand final. And he was a cousin of Dick Reynolds. And... Uh, Dick was the one I was waiting to beat, I wanted to beat. And I said to Whoppy, sitting down there, baby face, and no smile, I said, to, I want Reynolds. I said, you want you to follow him? If he goes to the laboratory, you go with him. <laughs> if you can't go in, I said, stand at the gate till he comes out. I said, I want him followed, I want him pushed, shoved and everything. I don't want him to get a kick. And Oppie said, he's my cousin, you know, Jack. I said, does that make any difference? He's not one bloody bit on lock his head right off. <laughs> By God, it's love to play with those fellas. They make your coaches, those fellas, the fellas you played with. And I had a lovely lot of them there. Perkins, he was mad too. Charlie, Charlie Priestley was another one mad. In fact, I used to have a little potion there that I used to give them, and they used to all go mad. But uh, I had so many enjoyable times, did some wrong things I know on a football field, but I was a gentleman, and, and uh, off the field I was very nice. But. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget, you know, things that happen in football, they keep in your memories. There was a fellow came down broadcasting there one day at Richmond, and uh, I hit him, hit Reuse, and it was, I think it was, and, and he said, oh, it was his first broadcast too, I'll never forget it. He said, the animal, he's done it again. And uh, he said, I can't give his name, but the die has just taken another mark and the crowd is still abusing him. So I've got to go home, I had a lovely mother, a lovely sister, both of them crying when I got in. What did you do today? What did, he calls you an animal, he calls you everything, you ought to hurt him. I said, who? He said, the broadcaster. I said, I'll give him broadcaster. <laughs> so I went down to his broadcast next week. I had my shorts on, I weighed about 13 stone, 12 feet as a melee ball. And as he walked in to apologise, I didn't know that. I grabbed him by the tie. Well, I got him up like that. I said, I'll give you safe. I don't care what you say about me, you dirty, more nice woman. You know? I said, but my mother thinks I'm lovely. And she was crying when I got home, and so was my sister. He said, oh, Jack, come on, just come to apologise. And he couldn't talk much as I pushed him. <laughs> Bentley rushed to us and took me and put me back on the table. And that was all right, but my brother in law, he was mad. He was football, I was mad. He, he barracked for Richmond, he was the greatest. He used to broadcast over in the corner of the grandstand. Here's Alan's got over there, Alan Turner, you know him a few blokes in there, and he's calling him everything. Your dyer's gonna murder you, you big mongrel. Well, he's got the bloke and the finish at half time, he's coming, and he's stuttering. And he said, that, that brother-in-law of yours, Jack, that brother-in-law, I gotta go back to the studio, I can't put up with it. <laughs> and I, I had to get Alan, tell him to shut up, and let him go, but I got five best in the grounds, one after the other. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story. But it's lovely to see a little bird here tonight. I haven't seen him for a long time. By Jabe, it's nice to see you. Another terrific little player that uh, didn't know fear at all. And uh, a great back pocket player for Richmond. Lovely to see you, Freddie. And Stokesy, I said, are you coming over when I went to sign him in, in Tasmania? He said, if I can't get the fear over, I'll swim over. That's the fellas I like in football. And uh, he swam over and uh, finished up a terrific football. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I can go through a million of those stories, but uh, you'd think I was bragging a bit because uh, I had a lot of injuries too, as well as uh, a lot of uh, uh, those good times. Uh, Chitty put my eye out of circulation for six months. I was blinking in the milk shop up there, and my wife thought I was blinking at the Sheilas. <laughs> that Jenny Kelly, I knocked two, two of my teeth out. And I went out to the doctor's, I was out to the chemist there and got home one half full, but coming to church the next morning it started to wake, so 
I went to the dentist, I'll never forget it, Nickel of his name down there, hope there's no relation to him here. He said, sit in the chair, half whacked he was. <laughs> I just put the thing in those days and went, <coughs> well I hit the roof and my tooth hit with me, you know, but good God, you wouldn't do it to a dog. And he charged me a shilling too, that's why I was crooked. <laughs> That's something I liked about the Richmond doctor now. He's very much like the old doctors we had. You never hurt when you went to him at all. Never hurt. You know, mate, if you had a broken leg, oh, just you'll be all right. Just go home and have a rest. You'll be good as gone. I think this doctor that I'm going to now, got a bit of cholesterol, and he uh, he just says, oh, you'll be all right. Go home. He doesn't do nothing for you at all. So uh, uh, he's here the night too somewhere. He, all he does is, where is he? Oh, there. He just sticks a pin in your arm and says, you'll be right. I don't know whether he's giving me drugs or not. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, one thing I do like is to see so many faces, so many Richmond supporters. By Jove, football's got to have its heroes. I didn't want to be a hero now, it just happened that way. Well, it was just absolutely fantastic to, to hear Jack. Uh, I don't know, Jack, uh, I don't really think that should be your last public speaking uh, engagement. I, it was just fantastic to hear you and uh, so much enjoyment to each and every person here tonight. A great Richmond identity to talk to us now. You started working uh, at the VFL and I suppose in those days you didn't realise that uh, he was not going to go back as the copy boy, he was going to go back as one of the El Supremos. And certainly when he came to Richmond in 1968 and he had to take over the reins from Graham Richmond, it was a, a huge job for a young administrator to step into the shoes of the person who they called the Prince of Secretaries. But he recruited magnificently for the club and of course in 69, 73 and 74 was secretary or general managers as they are known today was able to recruit all the great players that played in those sides to the Richmond Football Club. And in that, of course, there'd be a million stories. Because in those days, you had to be first out and on the doorstep, and you had to be very, very persuasive. Of course, I suppose in 1973, at the Brownlow medal count, when uh, I was installed as a hot favourite to win the Brownlow medal, and I didn't win, and Alan Swab stood on the tables at the Southern Cross Hotel and threatened to fight the entire North Melbourne camp, <laughs> including Jack Hamilton, the VFL, and every umpire who was present. He called them mongrels, idiots, and offered to fight them all outside if any were still standing inside. <laughs> he caused quite a furor at that particular time, let me tell you that. And from that point on, he always used to say to me, who cares about the bloody Brownlow anyway? <laughs> well, of course, he might have changed because he's pretty big there now. But he's always been a great Richmond identity and one of the truly great administrators of this club. And obviously, we were very successful in that era because we had the best. And the best was in Alan Swab. Thanks very much, Kevin. Ladies and gentlemen, I think, Kev, actually the uh, Brownlow medal was 1974 because uh, I can remember, well, I can remember it very well because uh, when I was about to fight everyone in the uh, hall, um, and Ian Wilson at that stage was starting to duck and he was saying, I've got nothing to do with you, but I did have one great friend there and a stalwart who would have helped me enormously in a brawl against 500, and that was Charlie Priestley. <laughs> and I think the count at that point is that I'd had about 25 clarets and Charlie had had 26. <laughs> I would like to, um, in the beginning, congratulate the uh, former players on the production of Tigerland. It's a, uh, it's a marvellous book and it certainly does bring home to all of us great memories of 
a great club. I still go to work every day and I get paid and I think that after 31 years you just had a very fortunate life to be able to go and uh, be involved in football and get paid for doing it. I know and I hope that my son Cameron, who's now general manager of the club, does the same. It's a bit frightening to think that it's only 10 years ago when Cameron was uh, probably typical of the swab tradition a bit of Richmond at that time, that every time Richmond got beaten he used to throw his beanie away. <laughs> Fortunately, we had a good team and it didn't cost him, his mum too much money to replace it each week. But it was uh, a great thrill for me and I guess I only go back 20 years at Richmond and you hear legends like Jack Dyer talk who go back 50 odd years, 60 years and others in this room the same. But 20 years or the eight years that I had at Richmond, I um, suppose who knows where your football career may end but uh, I'll always treasure most of all those uh, eight great years and uh, when Graham Richmond approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in replacing him as secretary I just couldn't believe my luck to go to Richmond it was going to be fantastic it's going to be a little bit different to uh, another great friend of mine in Jack Hamilton who uh, played with uh, Jack Dyer's uh, nemethus uh, Collingwood and Jack actually when he retired as chief commissioner of the VFL and we're all sitting in this room and Jack's a master of one-liners and someone said to him, uh, now that you're leaving the VFL as Chief Commissioner, are you going to go to Collingwood as General Manager? To which he replied, well, Jesus, I've just got up Alcatraz, are you going to send me to Devil's Island? <laughs> and I think if uh, Jack Dyer had his way, that'd be right, wouldn't it, Jack? That would be so. There's been many famous people mentioned tonight with Richmond and I don't think that I should talk about them because they've been mentioned so much but there were many other people who were involved with the Tigers in my time and uh, some very interesting stories. One of the persons who uh, a lot of us had a lot to do with and uh, of course a life member of the club was the late Senator Pat Kennelly. Senator Kennelly was a famous numbers man. It's rumoured that he got Curtin and Chifley to the number one position in the land and was very very, very good having Charlie Callender as a helper at the Richmond elections with pinching the ballot boxes. <laughs> but when I got to Richmond and everyone told me it was a family club, and it was a family club, we're all very friendly, except that when we did get to the committee, we did have a few blues. And I said to Senator Kennelly one night, it would be lovely if the 12 of us all agreed on one thing at the one time and the decision was unanimous. And he said, son, he said, never win 12-0. He said, always win 7-5, otherwise too many people to thank. <laughs> <laughs> when I, uh, that was one of my first lessons at the club. And the other one was, um, it's a little known story this, but uh, in those days, the Richmond Football Club also had a fourths team, which played in the Melbourne Boys League. It's Richmond Force that later became Essex Heights. Had a lot of success and Tommy Allen who's here tonight was coach of that. Oh. And the story I'm going to tell, I might say that Tommy Allen wasn't beyond what this either, but uh, I suddenly found out uh, with Bill Baromeo coaching the fourths and Ray Jordan the thirds that suddenly a lot of good players were coming down, playing one or two weeks and disappearing. And so I thought I'd have a look at this and um, what was happening was the classic ring-in. That every week, um, because it was too hard for the boy, Michael Green was one of them. He was playing at Xavier College but uh, it was hard to get a permit in time so he'd play in the Melbourne Boys League. And the next week it'd be someone else. And they all played uh, as this guy Ronnie Baromeo. Now Ronnie Baromeo was the son of Bill Baromeo. But Ronnie uh, wasn't a footballer, he was actually the lead, songer in one, lead singer in one of Australia's top rock bands at the time. And he was away travelling all around the world, overseas, uh, throughout Australia, and he was, at that stage, uh, none of the players had long hair, but Ronnie had it right down his back. That's when we saw him occasionally in town, but he never ever once played for Melbourne Force. 
So anyhow, the whole year went on and uh, nothing happened. No one woke up to it. But the big problem came when Ronnie Borromeo won the Melbourne League's Best and Fairest Award. <laughs> Fortunately, Ronnie was in town at the time and we gave him a quick lesson in football and he got up and he quite liked the medal when they put it around his neck and he made a very good acceptance speech. But one of the um, most uh, controversial tribunal hearings, of course, was in 1974 after the fight and the race in which the whale had been struck by Rot and Ronnie Andrews and we all went to the tribunal and the tribunal chairman was John Winnicky. And as everyone went into the room he said, tonight's a night where everyone's going to be very serious. There's no lies to be told, no protecting anyone, no doing the wrong thing, you tell the truth. So everyone got that message very clearly. So in came the whale and they said, well, what happened to you? And the whale had a, his nose spread right across his face, the biggest broken nose of all time compliments of Ronnie Andrews. So they said, what happened to you? He said, well, I really don't know. He said, well, remember, I said, you tell the truth. He said, well, I'm trying to tell the truth. He said, but it was the pain that was of concern. And Winnicky said, well, how do you mean the pain? He said, well, I'm sure that I wasn't struck. I'm convinced I was kicked by the trooper's horse. <laughs> Along into the room then came Malcolm Brown. Has anyone played 14 more famous games than Malcolm Brown? <laughs> but Malcolm, Malcolm was a, and I'll say this very seriously, that Malcolm was a fabulous clubman for Richmond and uh, in, the, in the five years it took us to get him over. <laughs> Cameron said to me today, how, how come Malcolm was so famous? I said, well, he was cross until you came over for five years before he played. He was actually <laughs> here for six years. But Malcolm was the cause of the fight and the race because about a minute before the siren went at half time, Malcolm got involved on the ground in a wrestle with Graham Jerker Jenkins, who was then playing for Essendon, but of course was a very well known and recognised player at Collingwood beforehand, who had the nickname of Jerker. So Winnicky said, well, how did it all start? He said, well, uh, he said, we got into this wrestle and we were grappling each other. He said, and uh, player Jenkins grabbed me by my private parts. He said, well, what did you say? He said, well, what I said was, now I know why you call me jerker. One of the other great personalities, and we really haven't mentioned him tonight, was Charlie Callender, and we all love Charlie very much. Yeah. Great Richmond personality who uh, some silly policeman tried to arrest him one night for being over 0.05 on his bike riding down the footpath outside Punt Road. The other uh, times, of course, when Mel Brown put his bike outside the brothel over the road and uh, <laughs> photographs were taken of the incident. And, relayed home to the dear Therese, his wife of 60 odd years, who said, silly bloody old fool. <laughs> but we, as Charlie was getting old, or getting older, he never got old, um, we decided to really update the property room and we bought him an electric pump. At that stage, and this was quite remarkable when I got to Richmond too, because the football's there, we didn't have any Sherons or Faulkners, and this was 1968. Charlie was still letting the guys run around kicking Jack Dyer autograph footballs. <laughs> well, once you put these with the electric pump, the first 10 Charlie blew up all exploded. <laughs> Finally got the, got the act right, and uh, Cole Saddington, who was the assistant coach at the time, took these footballs out onto the ground and kicked one of them and came limping in you know, and Sato was a pretty tough guy, came limping into the room charging after Charlie because he'd broken his toe. <laughs> great personality. I guess that there was a great era of football and we're all looking forward to the next great era. And there's no doubt, I'm sure that Richmond's going to enjoy that. Similarly, I think that perhaps as time goes by, you tend to take some of those old times a bit for granted, and particularly at the time, but 
You should really appreciate the thought as you go along to the ground to play in the grand final. What a fabulous thing it is. I promise you the only thing that's better than it is when you wake up the next morning and you can say to yourself, well, yesterday the Tigers won the Premiership. Thanks very much. I suppose uh, all the great Richmond sides owe a great debt to Graham because it is very difficult when you are down for many, many years to lift a club up the ladder. And when you consider the Richmond Football Club last played in a grand final in 1943, when Graham first took over as secretary, that uh, there was a lot of work to be made up and a lot of ground to be covered. But in four short years, it was recognised that uh, he recruited players far and wide, more successfully than any other secretary had done in the history of the game. He recruited players, I'm told, with some marvellous ideas. Always a box of chocolates for mum. <laughs> with hundred dollar bills underneath the first wrap. <laughs> he recruited Dickie Clay by giving him a radio which we thought was fair enough until he drove up in his new Holden with the radio in it. <laughs> he recruited Eric Moore, played full forward in the 69 grand final side, with a kit bag of one dollar bills and threw them in the air. They all fluttered down, the whole 500 of them. Eric thought there was five million dollars there. <laughs> And he was told that he had to sign before the last one hit the ground. <laughs> Which he did. <laughs> of course, I can remember that day in 1974 because, as I say, Graham has fought many battles for Richmond on the field and off the field. I can remember, Malcolm, at the time you said you thought it was Superman. <laughs> Of course, that day could have ended there, except the Essendon supporters were incensed that Malcolm Brown was punching up their players. And they jumped the fence to protect their players. It could have ended there, except the Richmond supporters incensed that the Essendon supporters had jumped the fence, decided that they would lend a hand. And it could have ended right there and then except the Essendon Committee. <laughs> Upset that their supporters and players were being punched, decided to come onto the ground. And it was at that significant point of time that Graham sounded the bugle <laughs> and led the Richmond Committee onto the ground. <laughs> I remember the incident very well. <laughs> because I was standing right next to the race when it occurred. And I went straight up the race. <laughs> I can remember looking out of the glass panes there at the Essendon football ground, overlooking the, the oval. And I remember saying to myself, bloody hell. <laughs> What's Graham doing down there? <laughs> And I can remember old Charlie Callender in the rooms. 20 oranges and 20 drinks laid out on the table. And I said, what do you think, Charlie? He said, well, someone's got to drink and eat them. <laughs> Which I did. I was crook after that game at Windy Hill, I can <laughs> But I can remember the aftermath because the club at that stage was uh, struggling. But of course, uh, 
there was a great rally behind Graham and the club at that particular time and the club then was able to go on and pull off one of its greatest victories in the 74 grand final. I think that uh, we all realise the tremendous uh, debt that we owe our next special guest, Graham Richmond. But truly, it is a great pleasure to be here this evening. To be with Richmond people, look, I don't think it could be any better reward in your life than to be a part of something that has been the biggest part of my life. And when I look around here, I can see people, not only the ones that have been with me through the good years, but the ones that were in a position to encourage me, and I can only speak in the personal vein, at a critical time in one's life when you come as a young man, not knowing which way you're going, to come to a club which offers you friendship, which offers you encouragement, which puts you in a position to join people that as a 10-year-old youth, riding a bicycle up the Ballerine Hills from Port Arlington to Clifton Springs, to go and watch blokes that had played the day before against Geelong, relaxing over the weekend, to see Jack Dyer in the real flesh, when all you'd ever heard of him was on the Kiora Sports Parade. <laughs> because you must realise that at those stage, communications were very, very limited. But oh, what a job Hector Lacey did on Jack Dyer. <laughs> Captain Blood. Yes, look, this game is a magnificent game. It presents itself, but it needs these characters to make it real to all of us, to people that we can identify with, to have our heroes to be able to survive the tough times. When we read about Struggle Town, how close we identify with our club. When the club has played a part in people's lives, when people have been battling for a mere existence to live, and the only hope they've had each week has been able to come along and support these people that we hold so dear in our own lives. That's how real football is in our existence. You can talk about religious religion, and I don't want to appear sacrilegious, but in this state of Victoria, I think it's fair enough to say that religion and, foot and politics have been supplanted by football in the hearts and minds of many people. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but it is an absolute fact of life, that we either barrack for a team or we don't barrack for a team. We either join a club, we stay with a club, that has changed in time, but it's a magnificent thing here tonight to see boys like Kevin Morris, Brian Wood, Gerald Betts, who've had occasions for various reasons to leave this club, to be here tonight. And God, when I look at Mel Brown, People can't understand why I love him. He almost got me locked up. <laughs> but he epitomises many of the things that we admired in Richmond. Because look, this society of ours, we have school teachers, we have philosophers, we have social do-gooders who decry the fact that we take part in a man's game, a game which involves physical contact. Everybody tries to alter the rules. They try to take on our main competitor, basketball. But when you look at the heritage that we've inherited this club, when we've been at our very, very best, there's never ever been anybody played like we have played. Because the only essence in our conscience has been that winning has been the only thing that's mattered. I suppose when I look through the book, they are the only photo that I really am proud of. And when I can look back at it, it had a, it had a feeling of abysmal disappointment. It was a photograph when we were beaten in 1972, because I can tell you quite truthfully that the magnificent premierships that we did win and the magnificent players that played in them, they were something that I really and truly expected to win. But the memories that I have that hold the deepest, bitterest cut into me are the ones that we lost in 72 and 82 because we had sides that were good enough and we blew it. 
and somehow or other losing at Richmond was a philosophy that we never had any part of. And I think that this isn't a bad thing. I think if young men are, are bred to believe that winning, look, in your lives you participate and you take part and you compete in everything that's worthwhile in your existence. And I can't see anything wrong with wanting to give it your very best shot. And when you put yourself and your soul and your body and your commitment on the line in front of 105,000 people or 110,000 people, then it must naturally follow that when you fail, that when you fail, any true man must feel the anguish and feel it deeply. And with this club, the heritage that we've got from some of the people that have been mentioned before here is the fact that we really have been competitors. That in our low times, and look, we've had our low times, but I don't think anybody can really appreciate success without experiencing low times. That when I know and I look around and I see that Cameron Swab has joined us here now, then I feel that the heritage that's handed on to him, as it was handed to me by Jack Dyer, who said, look, if you're ever half as good as Percy Page, you'll do the job. And that was something. Percy Page was a man who came to Richmond. We'd won the double in 20 and 21 and fallen on hard times. Then Percy was appointed secretary of this club. In those days, there were no such things as cars much. Percy would jump on the train on a Friday night and not be seen till Sunday night or Monday morning. And by hell, he came back with the signatures of all the great players that joined the 1932 and 1934 premiership team. But before that, his medal was really tested by three successive losses against Collingwood in 28, 29, 27, 28 and 29. And you need to know the downside to appreciate the upside. Percy, unfortunately, found the downside a bit hard going and turned it up before the real glory came. And later on, of course, he went to Melbourne and came up with a magnificent Melbourne sides that came out and won a triple premiership. On the way, of course, he brought Checker Hughes to Richmond. And it was my great fortune to have the friendship of these people. The same it was my great fortune to have the friendship of my boyhood heroes. <laughs> A fighting fury with the tiger land. In any weather you will see us with a grin, risking head and skin. If we're behind, then never mind. We'll fight and fight and win for we're from Tiger Land. We never weaken till the final siren's gone. Like the tiger of old, we're strong and we're bold for we're from Tiger. And so ended another chapter in the history of the Richmond Football Club, the night the tiger roared. <laughs>